Hello, my name is Alex Isles and welcome to our Bayer Roman Fort here in South Shields in the northeast of England. And in today's episode, we're going to look at the officers who ruled over the men while they served on the northern frontier of the Roman Empire. And traditionally, we call these guys centurions. Now, the interesting thing is the Romans probably didn't say the word centurion. We have a soft C in English today. They probably would have used the sound that we now use as a hard K. And so many people now say centurion, which would have been the name for them. Alongside this as well, for cavalry units, their officers were called decurions. So you had a centurion, a centurion or a centurion, and a decurion, who was the officer in charge of all horses. Now these guys had a different experience. They had served longer in the Roman army. They had been promoted from the ranks because of their experience. Though on occasion we do have some references to suggest that family connections could get you promoted to centurion or something like that. And so these guys were highly experienced soldiers who had a full military career and now were responsible for maintaining and organizing the lives of the soldiers underneath them. So because of that, they had certain privileges that the other soldiers did not have. And we're going to look at that in forms of their housing right here. So at our Bayer Roman Fort, as I mentioned before, there are reconstructions and we're about to enter the Centurions or Centurions house right now. So right here, as we enter it, we can see there is a lot more space. He has about twice as much space as the soldiers under him. And we remember before that an eight-man unit was in two rooms, half the size, whereas one man has now got twice the amount of space of the soldiers around him, and he lives in this apartment right here. As they've done it out, they've represented a centurion with a family. So I'll just come inside here. We can see this is the centurion's bedroom. He's got it nicely set out. He's got a table with a drinking cup and a container to contain wine. Alongside that as well, we can see with this chest of drawers right here, but on top of it, there is a basket with wool inside. So that's representing the fact that this centurion is married and his wife also lives with him inside this apartment. When he, she lives inside with him in the apartment, alongside this as well, they also have a secondary bedroom, which could again be for his wife if she lives separately, or a guest room. But we can see that this room has got one room for the centurion and one room with his, for his wife, and you can see her footwear down there as well. If you've watched the episode on Regina as well, and about her and Victor and her husband Baratis, uh, the slaves who were released, you can, may have noticed on her memorial there was a treasure chest. This has been reconstructed right here, so this could easily represent a wealthy woman who was uh, married to her husband who's a professional soldier, and they have these wonderful beds and much better standard of living than the soldiers who are living next door to them. Alongside this as well, you can see he's also got a kitchen. And in this kitchen, it's set out for food preparation. And just at the back of it as well, there is a toilet. This is quite common, and we find this throughout Roman archaeology, that the bathroom was often in the same place as the kitchen, because then you could pour wastewater down there and flush it, and so the centurion had his own loo. And this is quite special, because the soldiers, they would have to rely on the public toilet, which is behind the commanding officer's house in the far corner of the Roman fort. So you have to get out at nighttime, go out there, or they would go to the toilet between the barrack blocks and they would have an area between those different locations where they could squat down and use the toilet there before returning to bed. Um, and the main form of Roman toilet paper, we actually know, would have been scraps of fabric. And those scraps of fabric would then be washed and reused until they were no longer be usable. But so we've got the, the area here where we can see the centurion is having his food prepared by someone, most likely his own personal slave, because again, they're allowed to have slaves. He's got a pair of rat, uh, hairs up there that he's going to eat. He's got some fish and also imported wine, which again shows his status. He's, uh, this is a reconstruction of an amphora, which is in the Great North Museum, Hancock, and has a stamp on it that shows it was imported from Spain. So we can see again that there's that nature of imports. The centurion, he's paid more than his soldiers, and because he's paid more than his soldiers, he's able to import in things that are gonna make his life much more comfortable. 
um, we can see from most Roman records that a normal soldier was paid around about 300 denarii a year, an auxiliary man around about the same or a little bit less. A centurion, on the other hand, is on about 12 to 18,000 generally and is on a far better pay, so they are living very comfortably. We can also see right here, this room has been done out as a cot, a bed for a child. So again, centurions, unlike their soldiers, are actually legally allowed to marry. Now, in the early period, in the first and second centuries of the Roman Empire in Britain, the soldiers are not actually legally allowed to marry. Um, they are supposed to instead commit their lives fully, and this is because of a disaster that occurred in the Turenborg Forest in Germany, when legions were ambushed and they had their wives and children with them, which then meant they tried to defend their families and they had a horrendous military loss. The army decided, and the emperor as well, that there was too much investment into their families. And so because of that, they said soldiers are not allowed to marry. When they're not allowed to marry, this meant that the, um, the army would have unofficial girlfriends living outside in the vicus in the civilian settlement. But officers like centurions and the commander were allowed to marry. And so their families would live in small apartments like this, which were far more luxurious than the soldiers who lived around them. So you can see that the centurion's child would have been here, the centurion's wife, there could have been a guest room. In certain um, centurion's apartments, we see small little bathhouses have been built in. And because they've got much more disposable income than a soldier, with 12 to 18,000 denarii a year, when a normal laborer is getting paid one denarii a day, so maybe turning over 100 to um, maybe 200 denarii a year if you're a normal skilled laborer, whereas, you know, a soldier is being paid between 200 to 300 denarii a year and in a cavalryman 320, you can really see how it scales up to the centurion or the curian who are being paid far more and then the commanding officer is on a huge sum of money compared to that. So we can see right here that that is what money buys you, a much more comfortable life, a much more Roman life with imports from all across the empire, with your own personal slave, with your wife and child and your children living here with you. And that's the benefit of being the professional soldier that other soldiers would aspire to. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode today, being able to learn something about the life of a centurion, his family, and what it would have been like up here in Northern Britain during the period, and why people would have been incentivized to sign up to the army. And if you served really well, you might get promoted to a, uh, to a, a rank where you would have far more wealth and power than you would have ever done in your normal civilian life, unless you had become a very, very successful merchant or something like that. So I hope this tells you the story of the Centurion up here in Northern Britain and you get a real sense of what it would be like to live inside one of those apartments with your family. I really hope you've enjoyed the episode today and if you have, please do subscribe if you aren't already. And if you'd like to, I now have a Patreon where you can have an influence on the content I create in the future by signing up there. Until next time though, stay safe and well and thank you so much for joining me for this episode.